I cannot lie to you. Creation Day number four is, in my mind, the most awesome, the most mind-boggling, the most awe-inspiring of all of creation. In my mind, this day displays the power and magnificence of our God more than any other. ago, I was watching a documentary about the Hubble telescope. You can imagine how many incredible photos they showed, mostly of nebula, as they are the beauty queens of the universe. Toward the end of the show, they said that one day they pointed the Hubble at what they believed was one of the darkest areas of the night sky. After 800 exposures taken over the course of 400 Hubble orbits around the Earth and a total exposure time of 11.3 days, the picture they got back was labeled Hubble Ultra Deep Field. It is not the most impressive to look at and certainly not the most beautiful photo taken, but it should knock your spiritual socks off when you understand what you're seeing. Each of those lights in the frame are not single stars. They are entire galaxies. Nearly 10,000 galaxies are seen in this one picture of one tiny, relatively speaking, piece of space. I remember when I saw this photograph on my TV screen that I jumped out of my seat hooting and hollering because of the obvious implications of that photo as it relates to the power of God. I don't remember if my family was there, but I'm sure they would have thought me insane. Again, I immediately started to research until I found where I could get a copy of that photo. That was back when the internet was, a, was not a good source because of the low resolutions and slow speeds used at that time. I think I was actually still on dial-up back then. I did buy the picture, have it framed, and it is hanging in my house to this day. My obsession with space is not new. It has always been there, at least since September 15, 1965, the air date of episode one of Lost in Space. With all that said, I completely understand that my obsessions do not define which day of creation is the most important. All of creation, without exception, is mind-boggling. All six days of creation are amazing and beyond our ability to comprehend. But day four, day four is still my favorite. Let's look at what happened by reading Genesis 1, 14-19. Then God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for season and for days and years, and let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He made the stars also. God placed them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth and to govern the day and the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. There was evening and there was morning, a fourth day. On day four, God created our solar system and the entire universe it resides in. Not only our Milky Way galaxy, but every one of the estimated now. Please understand that no one actually knows for certain any of these numbers I'm about to quote. They are all guesstimated estimates. Currently, it is estimated that there are 200 billion, that's billion with a B, galaxies. Each one of those galaxies contain an estimated 100 billion stars each. 
Did you hear that? An estimated 200 billion galaxies with each galaxy containing 100 billion stars. Another source estimated that there are 200 billion trillion stars in the universe. I haven't a clue how many zeros that number has. Now mind you, even with the most sophisticated equipment we have currently available, even with the best space telescopes man has to date invented, we are incapable of seeing the edge of the universe, which means we haven't a clue how large our universe actually is or how many galaxies or stars there are. But we do know that God made the stars also, and he calls them by name. One of the closest galaxies to our Milky Way is the Andromeda Galaxy. If we were somehow able to travel at the speed of light, which is a distance of 5.88 trillion miles a year, it would still take us 2.5 million years to get there. Currently, it is estimated that the observable universe is about 93 billion light years across. That is a distance of 93 billion times 5.88 trillion miles. Again, that is only what scientists think they can see, and they have to admit even that is only an educated guess. I'm repeating myself here but I believe this emphasis is critical. We humans, we have no idea how much bigger the universe may be beyond the distance we think we can see. And people, you must listen to this. God is bigger. God is outside of the created universe. The created universe does not contain our God. The created universe is literally, actually, physically held together by our God. Hebrews tells us about Jesus, our God, in chapter 1, verse 3 of Hebrews. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And in Colossians 1.17, we learn about our Creator God that He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. Can you see why I get so very excited when I contemplate what God created on day four? By the way, I absolutely plan to visit the Andromeda Galaxy, as well as take a peek at the Alpha Centauri star system. I plan to visit all of the planets in our solar system as well as all of their moons and even more than that. I honestly believe that in our new bodies, in eternity, this will somehow be, impos be possible. I have no idea how it would be possible, but I know it would not be impossible with our God. Think about it. God created the entirety of the universe for our pleasure and most importantly, for his glory. He wants to, expects to, receive all of the glory and honor for his creative works. We can't glorify God completely unless we can see and experience the whole of his creation. I plan on, expect to, experience space travel in eternity. My former pastor, Doug Heck, will be right next to me in his own spaceship. We'll each have to have a a ship because frankly we'll both want to drive. You know, on second thought, he can drive. I'm going to be relaxing in the observation deck with a cold drink, a hot caramel flavored coffee, and a hot cinnamon roll watching the scenery go by. It doesn't matter how passionate I am or how much I desperately want this. Reality is, space travel in eternity is only my speculation. It, would, it was Doug Hex also. Except for 1 Corinthians 2.9, which is talking about wisdom, but I say that comes from, in part from experience, it states, But just as it is written, 
things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered into the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. Except for such, Scripture is completely silent on such things as this. But enough of my dreams. Let us get back to what we can know for certain from our lesson. Genesis 1 verses 14 to 16 tells us, Then God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. Verses 14 and 15 are obviously talking about the sun and the moon. And just in case we were unsure about that, God added verse 16 to clarify it. There is a great light for the day, the sun, a lesser light for the night, the moon. For today's lesson, I want to concentrate on just the sun and we'll save the rest of our universe for future lessons lessons. But before we can do that, there is an elephant in the room. We cannot talk about day four unless we talk about what secular science believes is a young earth creationist Achilles heel, distant starlight. Secular scientists teach that even at the current speed of light, most of what we see in the night sky is so far away that the light from those stars and galaxies could not, in 6,000 years, have sufficient time to travel far enough for us to see that light. Light see speed is approximately 186,000 miles per second. It travels a distance of approximately 5.88 trillion miles in a year. At 93 million miles away from the Earth, it takes the sun's light a bit over eight minutes to get to the Earth, traveling at the speed of light. As I mentioned earlier, the Andromeda galaxy is 2.5 million light years, not miles, light years from the Earth. That means traveling at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, or 5.88 trillion miles per year, the light from Andromeda would take 2.5 million years to get to Earth, where we could then see it. Of course, there are galaxies even farther away that would take not millions, but billions of year years for their light to travel to us, even at 186,000 miles per second. Yet, even with today's advanced technologies, we can see those galaxies in the night sky. Because we can see distant stars and galaxies, Secular scientists basically say, <laughs> gotcha. They believe that the fact that we can see distant starlight is proof positive that the universe is not thousands of years, but billions of billions of billions of years old. Secular scientists assume that we are locked into two processes. One, naturalistic processes. Or everything we see, everything we experience has a natural source explanation. And two, uniformitarianism. Whatever happened before is happening now, is the same way it happened in the past, does not on its own change with time. In both of these assumptions, supernatural explanations are rejected from consideration. You do need to know that secular scientists conveniently forget that the basic secular Big Bang theory also has some very significant light travel time problems. Dr. Lyle describes one insurmountable problem called the horizon problem. An extremely simplistic Pam speak description of the horizon problem is that the Big Bang model assumes an initial singularity. This singularity would have different temperatures in different locations. When this singularity does its bang thing and our universe explodes and expands rapidly, their theory, not mine, it should still have hot 
and cool spots. Yet the universe basically has a uniform temperature. And with the extreme distances, there has not been enough time to explain how this could happen. Remember basic science, high school science, the law of conservation of energy, which states that energy cannot be created or destroyed, but only changed from one form to another or transferred from one object to another. Because of the distance from one side of space to the other side, there is not enough time for energy to have moved back and forth to equalize the temperature throughout the universe. That is an extremely, extremely simplistic description of the horizon problem as I understand it. Sorry, but a trained scientist I am not. Let's move on to other things I also barely understand. What solutions do creation scientists propose for the perceived distant light problem? Well, there are several, some using naturalistic theories, some supernatural. One solution is the mature creation proposal. God just made everything instantly, all mature, without any processes, poof, planets, poof, light. The argument against this theory is that in the case of history that we see due to distant light that we may be viewing, if it was poofed into existence, it actually didn't happen. It is a false picture and therefore isn't true. Isn't true. As God cannot lie, a false picture is frankly something impossible for God to do. However, there is one flaw in this objection of a thought, false picture. It is that we, little humans, are making the determination of what is true history and what God can and cannot do in creation based on our finite knowledge of something we don't know and are only postulating. Remember from our last lesson, we were reminded that creation was a supernatural event. An example. Scientists claim that pulsars are formed from a star exploding into a supernova, with the leftovers of that explosion collapsing into a pulsar. It is much more complicated than that, but that is the gist of what it, they say happens. While the scientists may be correct on the current process of the creation of a pulsar, if God chose to create some pulsars on creation day four when he made the stars also, wouldn't that be his choice? And why would it be some, some false flag to fool us? Maybe God just likes pulsars. He certainly didn't need to first create a star, explode it, collapse it, etc., etc., etc. He is certainly capable of, poof, a fully formed pulsar or two now in his universe on day four. Another proposal is that the speed of light has been steadily decreasing. It started as near infinite when God made the stars and is now down to 186,000 miles per second. That's the number we see today. The problem is that our measurement techniques have been highly technically accurate for decades and modern measurements of the speed of light shows no measurable slowing down. If the speed of light was steadily decreasing over time, why would that process be stopping now? The differences that we see between older measurements and now are most likely due to our previous, older, less than accurate measuring systems and not a decrease in the speed of light. A naturalistic solution that has been championed by creation scientist Dr. Jason Lyle uses a general relativistic solution. I admit that I am a fan of Dr. Lyle, so I do not dismiss this solution easily and consider it a real possibility. He shows that measurement of the speed of light is actually the average one-way speed of light. Our measurement of light speed involves flashing a light on a mirror in a vacuum and measuring how long it takes for the light to return. Consider the round trip distance, then divide by two. 
With this measurement, it is assumed that the light is traveling the same speed both going away and coming back. What we have learned from Einstein's general relativity is that it is impossible to measure the one-way speed of light because it is impossible to synchronize two clocks at a distance. And the explanation of all those problems with synchronization have to do with a fourth dimensional space time. Now, please do not wait for me to explain that. Not even in PAM speak am I able to do so. Instead, let me share a short description from another creation scientist, Dr. Danny Faulkner. He explains, quote, General relativity is the current dominant theory of gravity, but it also is a theory of space and time. According to general relativity, Time is a fourth dimension that we must consider along with the three dimensions of space. The difference between time and the other three dimensions is that motion in time is only one direction, forward. In fact, all objects move forward in time at the same rate, so we can't even remain motionless in time. Motion through this fourth dimensional space-time is along, is along a geodesic, the shortest distance between two points. If geometry is flat, such as in a plane, geodesics are straight lines. However, if geometry is curved, then geodesics are curved, though they may appear flat within the geometry. According to general relativity, the presence of great mass or energy bends space-time. As objects follow their geodesics in this curved space-time, we perceive the geodesics as acceleration of gravity." End quote. Now, I'm sure that unlike me, all of you fully understood that. And I trust it was helpful. <laughs> Think about this. In our new bodies, in eternity, if this kind of stuff interests you, you will have the ability to understand it, and even more so. We haven't yet imagined the glories of our God. I am so looking forward to having that brain. Regarding the use of Einstein's theory of relativity to help explain the light-time travel problem, Dr. Jason Lyle has this to say. Albert Einstein discovered that the relationship between space, time, and the speed of light is far stranger and more interesting than anyone had ever imagined. Indeed, God upholds his creation in a way that is wonderful and contrary to our expect expectations. When we understand the true nature of space, time, and velocity, we will find that distant star starlight is perfectly compatible with the biblical time scale. And people wonder why these lessons are taking me so much time to complete. <laughs> Basically, this theory postulates that the average speed of light could easily be 186,000 miles per second on average, but that the different legs of that time could be different. The speed coming towards us could be infinite, and the speed going away could be whatever number gives an average of 186,000 miles per second when divided by distance. Yeah, my head hurts now too. When you read the details of this explanation, I admit it sounds very, very plausible. And the best that I can tell you from what I have read, this theory is both indisputable as well as unprovable, while at the same time being completely compatible with general relativity. You can put this explanation solidly into the could be, maybe, we'll have to check with God when we get to heaven category. However, there is one more theory. This one proposed by Dr. Faulkner, which is, in my opinion, equally as plausible as a general relatively relativity theory. Maybe more plausible. 
<laughs> this theory falls smack dab into the supernatural category and is completely compatible with days one, two, and three, as well as what we see in days five and six. Dr. Faulkner calls his theory the Dasha solution. To me, it sounds more reasonable to call it the speedy process solution. Initially, it sounds like the mature creation solution, but there is a distinct difference in the two. In the mature creation solution, Dr. Faulkner states that much of the universe could be an illusion. But in the Dasha solution, or speedy process solution, not so. Dr. Faulkner gives us an example of the Dasha, Dasha solution by describing the creation of plant life on day three using this solution. Quote, Notice that the manner of creation of plants is described twice, once in verse 11 and the other in verse 12. These two verses use different Hebrew verbs to describe the earth bringing forth plants. These verbs get across the idea of producing, sprouting, shooting, or thrusting. These are very active verbs indicating rapid growth. If we would have been witnesses to the process on day three, we, have, we may have seen something like a time-lapse movie of plant growth. This suggests that the development of plants on day three might have been what we see with plant growth and development today, but was abnormally fast. In other words, it was miraculous. Why was the, this fast growth and development of plants necessary? According to Genesis 1, 29, 30, both man and animals originally had a vegetarian diet. To fulfill this person, purpose, the plants had to be rapidly brought to maturity. The statements of Genesis 1 that what God had made was good has the implication of completeness. That what God made was meeting the purposes intended for them. End quote. What about me? Which theory do I subscribe to? I would have to say both Dr. Lyle and his naturalistic theory and Dr. Faulkner and his supernatural theory are both probably true. But all I really know, all any of the scientists know, is that God did it. Somehow, some way, God said, and, and it was so. Think about this. God created the sun, the moon, and all of those stars. Are we now arguing about whether he could figure out the light issues? Remember on day one, God created light and he didn't need a sun to do it. Also, God needed for the effects of the lights to be instantaneously, instantaneous, relatively speaking, so that they could serve their purpose for which they were created, to be signs for the seasons and for the days and for the years, as well as to tell the story of the glory of God as stated in Psalm 19.1. Now, let's look at the greater light to rule the day, our sun. I'm going to be perfectly honest. Well, actually, to the best of my knowledge, I have always been perfectly honest. So maybe the best thing to say is, I am going to be as transparent as possible. The more I studied the sun, the more I understood that most of this science is so far beyond my understanding, I am extremely unqualified for this task. Understand, I am just parroting what I have been reading. Our sun. Our sun is considered a main sequence star. 90% of all stars we know about are main sequence stars. These stars range in size from one-tenth the size of our sun to 200 times its size. The diameter of our sun is 865,370 miles, which on its surface can seem like a reasonable number until you understand that the diameter of our Earth is only 7,917 miles across. You could line up 109 Earths along the diameter of the sun. 
it gets really mind-boggling when you look at the mass of the sun. Again, we will compare it to Earth mass to help us get an idea of the size we're looking at. The mass of the Earth is 5.9 quadrillion kilograms. A quadrillion is a number with 15 zeros. That is the mass of the Earth. If you want to calculate the mass of the Sun in comparison, you need to multiply 5.9 quadrillion by 330,000. Let's look at this another way. If you could pop the top off of the Sun and start dropping Earths inside, it would take 109 Earths to fill it up. One last statistic that may help us comprehend the size of our Sun. If you could bag up all the planets and moons and everything in our entire solar system, they would only amount to about 0.2% of the Sun's mass. That's not 2%, but 2 tenths of 1% of the Sun's mass. I have learned that anything that has mass has gravity. The more mass, the more gravity. The mass of the Sun and its corresponding gravity is a major design factor in holding our universe together. Well, actually, I said that wrong, in holding our solar system together, as we will see in future studies. As I mentioned earlier, our Sun is a main sequence star. This means that it fuses hydrogen atoms to form helium atoms in its core. Don't ask me what that means. Don't ask me what that means it is doing or how it is doing it or why it does it. That gives me a headache, but it seems very important to those that need to know such things. Dr. Lyle calls it, calls it a stable hydrogen bomb, if you could imagine that. As previously mentioned, our sun is about 93 million miles away from us. It's light traveling at 160, 186 miles per second takes a tad over eight minutes to reach our geraniums. Our sun produces enough energy every second of its life to power over one billion major cities for a year. But what is the sun made of, you might ask, and how in the world would we know? It seems that in the early 1800s, an inventor named Joseph von Fraunhofer invented the spectroscope. A spectroscope splits white lines, white light into various wavelengths, which we see as colors. It was discovered that heating up different gases produce specific and consistent spectrums that could identify the element. Using this information, scientists were able to determine the material composition of the sun. Interesting side note, using this technique, science discovered what at the time they thought was a brand new element. They named that element helium from the Greek helios. At that point in history, science had not yet discovered helium on Earth. Helium was discovered in the sun before it was found on the Earth. The spectroscope also allows scientists to know the temperatures that gases are burning at. Scientists tell us the sun has six layers, three inner layers and three outer layers. The inner layers are, in the center, the inner core. The core is around 20 57 million degrees Fahrenheit. At that temperature, it is so hot that the hydrogen atoms experience nuclear fusion. Fusing hydrogen into helium that releases energy which gradually makes its way up to the surface. The next layer moving up from the core is the radiative zone. This zone is 45% of the sun's interior with a temperature around 7 million degrees Fahrenheit. 
third layer up is the convection zone. This zone has a lot of motion and temperature variations and seems to be the source of sunspots and solar flares. In the outer layers, you had the photosphere, about 300 miles thick, with a temperature range of 11,000 to 6,200 degrees Fahrenheit, followed by the chromosphere between 250 and 1,300 miles thick, with temperature ranges from 6,700 to 1,400 degrees Fahrenheit. There is a narrow region called the transition region next. There's a large change of temperature from the chromosphere to the corona that happens here. With an increase in temperature to 14,000 degrees Fahrenheit, the outermost layer is the corona. It has a thickness of more than 1,300 miles. We do not know the upper limits of the temperature that can exist here. It is the hottest our outer layer. What is interesting is that as hot and as thick as this layer is, we would have never known it existed, except that we can have, or we can see, complete solar eclipses. This is a layer we can see around the sun only during a full eclipse. Now, I've gone through a lot of numbers, a lot of measurements, a lot of really seriously nerdy stuff. Most of it, I just barely understand. This lesson doesn't even scratch the surface of the amazing, incredible star that rules our solar system that God created for us. I want to end this lesson with a quote by Dr. Jason Lyle from the Biblical Science Institute. The sun is designed to accommodate life on earth. It is the right distance and the right temperature for the earth to have liquid water, an essential ingredient for life. Some stars are far hotter and brighter than the sun. In order for a planet orbiting a blue star to have the right temperature for life, it would have to order orbit at a much greater distance. But blue stars emit far more ultraviolet radiation than the sun. Such radiation is destructive to light. Red dwarf stars are far cooler and fainter than the sun. To have liquid water, a planet orbiting a red dwarf would have to orbit much closer than Earth does. But red dwarf stars produce far less visible light in proportion to infrared radiation than the sun does. The sky of such a world would be considerably darker than that of the Earth. The sun is unusually stable. Many stars pulsate, drastically changing their size and brightness over time sometimes in a matter of days. Such pulsations would produce extreme temperature variations on any planet in orbit, making life impossible. Some stars experience super flares, powerful surface explosions caused by released magnetic field energy. Such explosions would be lethal, lethal if they were orbiting such a star. But the flares on the sun are mild, only about one ten thousandth the power of a super flare. The Lord designed the sun to do what it does, and it does it very well." End quote. In short, like the old fairy tale of Goldilocks, our sun was created just right to sustain our planet and thereby our lives. We have a great God. The heavens declare his glory, and more importantly, we should too.